Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. He's genuine, dynamic, compassionate, and the man behind the 24-hour talk and Christian hip-hop channel on Sirius XM. James Rosso, also known in hip-hop cultures as Trig, is the CEO of Holy Culture Radio and the founder of its parent company, The Corling Solution. With its programming focused on faith, art, vocation, and education, Holy Culture Radio hosts 13 unique shows that connect to popular culture where people are driven by passion, purpose, healing, hope, and transformation. The diverse content on its shows include urban gospel, underground gospel hip-hop, theological breakdowns of hip-hop and street culture, and old-school sounds. The Holy Culture brand vision is to promote Christian values and lifestyle through media. Rosso's book, Success on Your Own Terms, provides six ways to fire up your passion. Please welcome Trig. James thank Rose. you so much, Debbie, and thank you for such a kind introduction. Wow, thank you. <laughs> it's been great to have you here. So you dropped out of school really young, and mm -hmm. yet you had the foresight to work for your future, go back to school. Where did that come from? Oh, wow. Okay. So are you, you're talking specifically about leaving college and then yeah, uh, finally or, coming back at, <laughs> at yeah. the tender age of 34 and finishing? Well, no, even before that, didn't you drop out of high school? That was, yeah. And that was just for mm, a month or so while we were going through that difficult time with my father. So my father had disappeared. And yeah, I, I was with my grandmother and my father at the time. And I left and stopped going to school thinking that I could, you know, take care of the family finances, quote unquote, right? you know, fail miserably. Right. I mean, I had an after school job that I turned at the hardware store that I turned into my full-time job now. Well, listen, that local hardware store, you, you, sorry, not making enough money to cover mortgage and all those things. And so once I figured that out, moved back in my mom and humbled myself and we sent my grandmother back down South, I went back to school and was man blessed to be able to turn around from you know, D's and E's to A's and B's. And uh, it was so interesting because at graduation, <laughs> Channel 10 came and recognized me as the most, most improved student in the city, right? So on one hand, you know, thoroughly excited about that. On the other hand, it's like, wow, that this speaks to how far in the valley I had gone and had to come out of, so. But still, how common was that? And I know a lot of people in my generation that dropped out of school, they never went. I don't even know where they ended up, half of them. But that's something that's, inside you so mm. obviously somebody gave that to you i think my mother and my father i'm not sure either of them went to college right but my mom worked at a law firm and every now and then i would go down there when i was a, a kid and i don't know why debbie i just had this fascination with typing so i'd be happy just put me in front of a typewriter give me some paper let me just type my fingers away my father was an insurance man and a pastor and I, I don't know, it's not like I could say they were lawyers or doctors, but there was something there for sure. Because yeah. even to the point I alluded to earlier, when I went to college and my tuition fell out day two and they booted me out of Temple, I still went back in my 30s. Here's what I remember. I, I'll, I'll even give you a better example. So after I finished my bachelor's at 34, I went back later for my MBA. And when I was thinking about it, I was at J.P. Morgan Chase. I was a senior vice president. And many would say, well, you know, what for? And I remember having this conversation with a couple people who said, ah, oh, you don't need to do that. You don't. And for me, it just felt like I needed to. And I had the good fortune of sitting down with Jamie Dimon for what was supposed to be a 10 minute talk. And we talked for 30 minutes. And when I asked him about this topic, he said, listen, put, go back, put down a remote control at night, go back to school and get it. And coming away from it, here's what I'll tell you, just from a bachelor's or MBA perspective, when we grow up in organizations, get taught someone's way of doing something. Oftentimes we don't get taught the why and the root to be able to develop 
processes, infrastructure, et cetera, for ourselves, right? So it's one thing to pattern repeat, watch and repeat. It's another thing to understand the full context and say, well, that is his way of doing that. That is her way of doing that. But if the ultimate goal is X, I might develop a different way. And didn't you want to be a CEO before you graduated school? Like in a very early age. I mean, not many kids. What? I knew I wanted to be. That, well, well, part of it was I wanted to be in a high income earning position and be able to come back to the neighborhood and show there's another way to do it. I think many of us, and this is not uncommon, believe that, look, you, unless you're a rapper or someone, or unless you're a sports figure or something such as that, you are not going to make it out of here. And I just wanted to show you could be common person, take a common path and get all the things at that time that we thought were important. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a little different in my neighborhood, which was, you know, not the nicest end of town. And right. uh, those of us who left the neighborhood never went back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. listen, my mom still lives in the neighborhood I grew up in, right? And so it's so, I was going to say so funny. It's not funny. It's so interesting when you go, I, I try to go once a week, once every other week, and every now and then you bump into people you grew up with. And in fact, about three months ago, it was like a reunion of kids it's I grew up cool with. Though, I mean, isn't it? It's so good to sit there and go, we've known each other for 30 years, right? You just, oh my God, 30 plus years. And then for people to talk about their observations of each other, what we've seen each other do and how proud we are of each other. Those are special moments. And a lot of times I, I say this often, we don't think that we are the, the, um, the visual that some people have a success. You are more than you know it on any given day. We always feel like we have another that we have to go before I quote unquote make it. There are a lot of people looking at you and where you sit today, wishing they could be in your position, wishing they had done some of the things they've done, patterning themselves after you. So I just say that as an inspiration to anyone who listens to this podcast, understand where you are today. You are an active mentor. Yeah. Yeah. When did you jump into the music scene? Well, see, I did it all through school. I was initially a brass instrument player. I played a trumpet, the trombone, all those different things in the band and wanted to be a DJ, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> when my trumpet got stolen, I took the insurance money and said, hey, you know, can, can I do something with that? My mom had up until that point, you know, had been nice and trying to help me finance some of my hobbies, right? And, and one day she stood up and said, I'm not financing any, any more of your hobby because you could jump in and jump out. So if you want to do this music thing, she took me down to Zap store. I bought my first keyboard and stuff. And then I was trying to get turntables. I worked all summer when I was 14, try to buy some turntables. And I started DJing and developed a little reputation in the local neighborhood and started doing parties and such across Philadelphia. Got a little group of rappers together and we started working together, right? And we had our first record when we were, I think, juniors in high school, Lamar and I, who is now on the uh, Deaf Comedy, I'm sorry, Deaf Poet Jam tour, oh, I Black love Ice. Oh, Jammer. Yeah, he he's such a good guy. Black Ice, it was formerly known as Lamar the MC. <laughs> and we did our project together. And from there, it just took off. And it was always an after school thing, after work thing, et cetera. Right. And that was good for years. And then that transitioned after, you know, accepting Jesus Christ in my life, that transition to Christian hip hop after some people interrupted me. <laughs> and, and so the rest is history, as they say. So what was that Christian hip hop scene like when you first started out? It was, well, I knew what I knew. And at that time I didn't know a lot at all. Literally had someone who stopped into the studio. My studio was in my brother-in-law's store. And uh, they say, hey, a friend of ours is here. He, he would love to come down and listen to some of the tracks that he hears you working on from upstairs. So he comes downstairs and he's listening and I'm saved i'm you know a, walking with jesus but i'm still producing secular music right and so as he turns to leave he says wow some nice stuff you're working on it's just a shame it's not for the lord whoa 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 you know i'm i'm offended i'm upset I'm like, what you he said i'm just saying it's great that you're doing some some nice music it's just a shame it's not for the lord and he walks out i'm shell shot right i i, I finish what i'm doing and then the next day the conviction just hit me and that conviction led to two things. One, me telling all the secular groups I was working with, I'm done. Like, that's it. You need to finish your stuff. But the other thing it led to was me searching out, well, what 
else is available. And he was a member of a group I didn't know called the Cross Movement, which I will call the second wave, if you will, of Christian hip hop, leading that second wave. I then started digging and finding out, man, there's actually a lot out here. There's gospel gangsters, there's FFC, there's Soup the Chemist, there's wow. But again, when you went to the record stores, these wouldn't be the things on the first shelf. You had to walk through the aisles and look for those CDs, and so on and so forth. That's how I started growing into the community. Well, it's very much like hard rock and, and mm. metal. There is metal, hard rock, Christian. Like Skillet is one of right. the band names. And they're a little more mainstream now. But yeah, you're right. They they don't get the airplay that mm -hmm. some of the other bands do. Even though that some of them are just right. popular. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think things have changed a lot over time. At that time, it felt like if you didn't make it onto radio, you weren't making it. Yeah. And radio has a programming structure that is pretty tight. I mean, I, I'm in radio, right? So I feel like I can say without offending anybody, there's a structure there of making sure you are creating this loop of familiarity for the listener, and then you can introduce some new things every now and then. Right? That makes it very tight in terms of, given the plethora of artists there are, in terms of them really having a place to go. And then, of course, you have major stations and then, you know, college stations, public radio, et cetera. But at that time, that felt like it. Now, man, you don't you don't have to worry about gatekeepers. You've got something that people value. You can find your tribe and make sure you feed your tribe. Yeah. You got movies made of stories of artists who had gone to many lakes to try and yes. get out their song heard by radio DJs. Yes. Anything, anything. But today, Anything. I mean, today is actually that's another thing I'll ask you because today there's so much out there. Mm. That radio is still popular. Everybody thought the internet streaming and all of that would kill radio, but it never really. Right. Yeah. You look at stats, which I try to look at once a quarter when they're published, 90% plus folks still use radio as a form of discovery, right? Still have a habit of getting in the car and turning on the radio. So one, it's still valuable for discovery. Two, I think what we used to call radio jocks have become audio influencers. These are people who are right along companions, whether you're in your car or cleaning your kitchen. And I think what happened with radio is people thought, well, appointment listening is going to die just like appointment watching die, right? You're, gonna, you're not going to make people come in and watch their TV show at 8 p.m. We had TiVo, right, for a while, and then we got all these recorders on our Comcast, whatever you watch. And so I think people thought, well, obviously that's going to be true, true radio. People have tons of listening options, Spotify, Apple, Pandora, et cetera. But that companionship that comes with that DJ or show host mm -hmm. who has a tendency to talk about what you like to talk about every day. So for me, for us, for example, the fixed morning show is on at 6 o'clock every day. People know they're going to get two things. They're going to get what we what they call a spiritual detox, kind of unraveling and demystifying someone's journey and how they went from A to Z. And then they're going to do a real talk topic. They're going to dive into some cultural issue or something that people are wrestling with every day. So six o'clock every day, some people, I need that. Raina Day comes on at 10 a.m. and talks about, I say she knows more national holidays than anybody in the world. I mean, I've never learned so much about <laughs> national holiday. And then she's going to pray you up. And her and Anne are going to have some time talking about things that are happening in the news and such, but also put faith and some fun and laughter on top of it. And I could go on and on, right? But I think that's a big part of what keeps radio alive. Yeah. And I think the other thing, too, is the devices we have. We can listen to it in the background, whereas before you actually needed a physical radio. Right. But now, I guess, be careful what I say or she's going to start up, but. Got a Google Home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So I listen to a lot of radio stations on the Google Home. You just ask Google to play the. Yes. <laughs> there it is. Um, there it is. <laughs> so yeah, it, it is. It is so interesting if you turn back the clock to even back to 2012 when how mm -hmm. radio was going to die. But, Absolutely. So, it's actually the one medium that has. Mm -hmm seemingly grown where mm -hmm. tv has had issues we know newspapers and print has had issues but mm -hmm. radio seemed to like prove everybody rocks yeah 
It's had an audience, and and granted, it has over the last three years downtrended slightly on like on advertising purchases and whatnot. And I think you've seen some of that go to podcasts and their explosive growth and other places. But to your point, it's still a mega huge medium. And really, a podcast is just kind of an elongated version of a radio, in a way, without the music play. So you played football at a young age, too. And if you didn't get hurt, do you think you would have pursued that as a career? I think yes. I mean, I loved playing football. Fullback, tight end, defensive end. Loved it, loved it, loved it. I would have pursued it, but having, you know, now I could be honest, right? I'm older in age, right? I'm really honest. I will work hard, but I wasn't special, right? Like, I look at other players, and I can, you know, you can see I, used, I, I always used to use Greg Luganis as like my example. Like Greg Luganis would dive off that hundred foot up platform, triple somersault, turn, twist, dot, almost zero splash. And it just looks so natural for him to do it. Now, we all know, right? The 10,000 hours principle, everything else and how much went into it. But there's still some gifting there, right? I didn't have a gift for football. <laughs> I like to play it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I enjoyed it with my body type, all those different things, right? But I didn't have a, I can't say I have a gift. Like my son plays, he's got a gift. He plays, he, he's willing to work hard. He's willing to do all those things. So yeah, I would have probably pursued it, but I don't think it would. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you never know, right? But I think that's probably the universe's way of saying, no, this game is a short Listen, <laughs> Debbie, I am so thankful for the no's. And sometimes you laugh about or think about all the no's you got, the jobs I applied for. I applied to be a Philadelphia police officer. I applied to be a housing, pro, you know, project police officer. I applied to be, don't ask me why, an airline steward. I, uh, can you see me on an airline plane really walking up and down the aisle serving Actually, people? Actually, yeah, but I could. No, no, you know, I'm just too big. I mean, I'm six, you know, six two and decent weight. But when you're in it, all those no's seems like they, they feel like they're crushing you. Yeah. But had I not got those no's, I wouldn't have worked to other things to get the yeses, right, that I, I didn't plan for. So, you know, at 14, 15 years old, I didn't say, well, yeah, I want to be president of B2B at Allstate Insurance Company. Are you kidding me? I had no idea. I well, didn't think about it, anything like such as that. And so the no's help you get to where you need. And just like we always say, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And yeah, and, and then a lot of times you needed that experience from that crappy job yes. in order to make things work even better with absolutely absolutely the term you use in your book here is reprogram your gps Mm. what does that look like for you that for me looks like making sure that every so often the road in which you intended to travel that you are traveling or that you reset that destination point right so how many of us have you know, gotten in the car and said, we want to go from our home to such and such, you know, I don't want to say grocery store, that's too close, but let's say to our vacation place that we're going and it's supposed to be a four hour drive. And the next thing you know, you're saying we're four hours in and we're not even close. What, what happened? Did the GPS just remap itself? Did we input the wrong destination? And by the way, did we maybe change our minds about where we want to go? And so for me, that, that program, and I use that example because I think it's relatable when we think about a global positioning system, something that is guiding us from point A to point B is to say, listen, you have gifts and talents that you're given. Those should hopefully flourish into a nice purpose, passion statement, and then your vision. And then your vision has to have behind that goals, which I always think about as, you know, rocks I'm going to jump on, boulders I'm going to jump on and get from one side of the river to the other side of the river. To, to do that, you need that GPS set that this is where I want to get to. And if I'm going to make a change, it's a conscious change with intention. And so that's the whole point around that. I love that phrase you use in the book, shift from drip. Mm. Let's talk about how society steals our dreams and tells us what we should be doing with our life. Yeah, <laughs> well, there's a lot in there. But, you know, I think the first time I wrote Shift from Drift, it was about not just groping in the darkness, right? This was before social media was as, as, 
Yeah, this was before social media was as prevalent as it is now, but this was more of the, let's just think about this. There are a lot of people in our life, well-meaning people in our lives, who will tell us, ah, that's a crazy idea. That, that, that there you're chasing, Debbie, you need to stop that and get back to this. This is the way to go. You and should un- have kids and settle down. Absolutely, right? <laughs> or you're made for this. And listen, we should always have wise counsel around us and consider it. But, you know, the first thing I would say is God gives a person a vision. He doesn't give it to a committee, you and a committee. He gives it to you, right? And so you need to, to think about that, work on that, and do all of the things I mentioned before, right? And turn, turning into plan. But the second thing is in today's world, the drift is easily created because we are bombarded with images of success. So maybe you should be social media influencer. No, you should do this. You should show products and, and, you know, dress up in products and walk down the aisle and this, that, and that. Unfortunately, because what is posted is typically highlight reels, not the work behind it, nor the failures in the valleys. It's all highlight reels, right? Do this, do this, do this, and you'll make it. This is how I made it. And so what it can do is just cause a person to continue to just move around chasing something, right? That quote unquote is successful versus what they've been given to do. And your show is still a baby. <laughs> um, the Serious XM part what, was a year in April. Yeah. yeah. So we're what? Yeah. So. Clearly, this partnership with Sirius XM has played a huge role in your success. So what was that process like to, I mean, you can't just walk, it's like that tape, that artist going to the radio station with their tape to play my yeah. song, please. You kind of had to do that to Sirius. So what was that process like to try and get them to convince you to be part of their game? So, yeah, and I mean... You know, I feel like it's a milestone for us. We turned 20 years old this year, Holy Culture, and a lot lot of milestones along the way. This clearly is a significant one that is, to me, significant for the community because it allows us to provide a platform to so many artists. We've played well over a thousand artists since we've launched. I would say the process is one, 10 years ago, we tried this and we didn't get the, the deal, right? And so they have a process at which they look at programming that serves historically underrepresented populations Mm -hmm. and considers. So every five years or so, I think they will open up a process and you can put in a proposal to lease a channel. And that's essentially what we did. And it's a thick proposal, right? Probably 60, 70 pages that includes everything from the concepts, the audiences we want to reach, why we want to reach those audiences and the impact we hope to make, the financials, all the shows, and what a five-year plan looks like. You know, what, what will we do over those five years? And I think, I mean, that's a high-level summary of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. that's a good summary because like that influencer post on Instagram. Yeah. That's the work behind getting things done. Absolutely. And, you know, and here's what I would say, too. When we failed 10 years ago, once again, I'm crushed. Why, why isn't this working? Why can't we, why didn't we get the deal? And so You're this time when I read... Right. I know. So this time when it's so interesting and that's just it, I was not ready. We were not ready by no stretch of the imagination. So this time when I go to do the proposal, I don't look at the one from 10 years ago. I write fresh from page one, put together the 70 page proposal. After we get to the point, they said, there, this looks interesting. Let's talk and get on the conference call and so on and so forth. And I remember coming home one day and in the mail was the letter. You made it. And I looked at my wife and I think I just welled up, like ready to cry. Um, couldn't believe it. Same thing the day we turned on here. I walked in the studio. I was just, can't believe it. But then I looked back at the one from 10 years ago. And I said, oh my God, this proposal is pale in comparison. Yeah. And I said, well, why is that the case? Well, 10 years ago, I had not had that president role at Allstate. I was still at J.P. Morgan Chase. I was still running a decent sized business, but I hadn't gone through the experience of creating a business from scratch. See, when I got to Allstate, it was, can you build out this $1 billion business over five years? Here's a team, here's some money, take a corridor somewhere, right? In the building or the campus and make it happen. That's different. And so going through that experience helped me a lot. And it was the same thing when I got to Legal Shield as president of the B2B there. It was a collection of businesses they said, why don't we put these all under one umbrella and make that bigger? And I was able to do that, create a new brand for it, pull teams together, help 
couple thousand salespeople be more successful, I believe anyway, with the processes and, and things we created, those experiences for sure helped me a lot in terms of, you know, the new proposal. And so lesson for me, right? We need to go through some things, <laughs> get some scar tissue. <laughs> but it's good that you did that proposal because it gave you that experience too, because now you yes. know what they're looking for. Yes. Yes. So what do you love about this station, about Holy Culture Radio and the hosts that you have in your programming? Oh, wow. It's a long list. I mean, I love that it is a number of people who are in a mindset of serving other people. Like I could just start right there. I think that that in something about those folks, the hearts of those folks, et cetera. But two, they're professional about what they do. These are people with experience. I mentioned the Fix Morning Show. Each of them have been hosting shows for well over six to eight years. Reign of Day has been 10, 12 years. Uh, King Size is newer at two o'clock, but it's done such a great job and it's so coachable and it's awesome. Wado is 10 plus years. And so, and I, same thing, if I run through the weekend, folks, so many people with varied experiences in this space, in the culture, in the community, who have brought it here to help make us what it is and the sound of it. So that's part one. Part two, I would say I love about it is trying to realize this programming that we want a faith, arts, vocation, and education. It is holistic, right? In its vision in terms of, you know, faith, you have to have some faith either in God or you're placing it somewhere else. Arts, we're left brain and right brain people. So we want to explore that side of your brain, the artistic side, vocation. Um, man, don't work, man, don't eat. <laughs> we want to help you be successful in your career and think about the stages of your career and the different things you can do and the different opportunities. And then education, education is just a continuum through all the, the first three things, right? You have to constantly be better and become a lifetime learner. And just, just getting that concept out of being a lifetime learner and not stopping. All those things to me are, they keep me moving in terms of, are we living into the promise that we've made for the station? And so those are some of the things I'm really excited about. And what's next? Where would you like to see Holy Culture Radio and Corlink go? Yeah, I think a couple of things. I think one, continuing to support the artist and coming up with new innovative ways to do that. I use a phrase every now and then where I say, you know, like airplanes have not had a technological innovative explosion in the last 15 years, right? Well, explosion is probably not the right word to use, but just like, you know, we haven't seen, like you wouldn't say, oh my God, 10 years ago, air travel used to be like this. And now I'm so thankful it's like this. Fill in that blank for me. I can't fill it in, right? And that's not to say that we haven't had any innovation. I would just love to create something that feels like it's serving differently, listeners and artists. I think that's part one. Part two, that it is a sustainable platform that sustains itself way past me and my CEO ship, for lack of better terms. And then I think the third thing is adding, being the places where people need us to be. I was going to say adding visual components. It's so beyond visual. It's, it's the Wayne Gretzky point of, you don't need to be where the puck is. You need to be where the puck is going. Right. And so I think one of the things that can happen is you get very Complacent is not even the right word. You're just trying to do what you do well and stick at it with limited resources on and so forth. But at the same place, if we want to serve, how are we in the places where people need the service? And so whether that's the different social channels that exist today, now you got thread, so you got to add that to it, right? The metaverse, I mean, hip hop, secular hip hop side is doing different rap events inside the metaverse. I'm not sure we've explored that yet, right? And so just thinking, I'm not saying we have to commit to it, just make sure we explore and understand, you know, what the opportunities are and how best to serve people. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for doing this Oh, thank this you. Interview. Absolutely. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, 
Thank you for watching and please subscribe.